All right, everybody. So today we're going to be talking about the building blocks of games and actually getting started with the tools that you need to make games. So um, everything that we're going to be talking about today is a few very, very important perspectives on games, kind of building up the vocabulary that you need as a game designer to start working in this space. And ideally, by the end of today, you will actually have all the tools needed to go off and start making games, but we'll be spending the rest of this course trying to come up with the tools to make bad games better, because even though you might have the building blocks to make a game here, you probably still don't have all of the tools to um, really make better judgments at how to improve something once you've already made it. So um, you may have some intuition, of course, but building up that vocabulary is going to help you get to a good game faster. So before we get into the building blocks, probably the first building block of a game is the game designer. And let's take a look at the overall role of what a game designer does, which builds off of the contents that we were talking about last time when we were seeing how little design decisions go into the overall experience. So first and foremost, it's important to recognize that the game designer is really an advocate for the player. That's your duty. That's who you are. And I put this underlined exclamation mark thing there because it's important to notice that when I'm talking about being the advocate for a player, I really am highlighting the designer here, the, the person with the duty of game design, because that person has to advocate for the player in all circumstances. That's really what they're there to do. And in fact, roles and jobs, roles and teams can be intentionally antagonistic to one another. That means that my duties intentionally misalign with your duties, my goals intentionally misalign with your goals, and we each need to advocate for our own part of this team. So as the game designer, you're going to be advocating that we make the absolute greatest experience possible, and then maybe everyone else on the team is saying, yeah, but we have to consider the budget. We have to make sure that our employees are having a good work-life balance. We have all sorts of other things that we need to concern ourselves with. So to be a proper advocate for the player, you can't get too distracted by the other aspects of production. You will be involved in all of them, absolutely. But you need to let the best people get their jobs done without you really interrupting too much. You are also going to have to recognize that the fun work, the work you want to do, doesn't necessarily translate to the best game for the player. You are going to have to take a step back and say, okay, even though this might not be fun for me, I have to do it to make it fun for the player. And distancing yourself like that is very, very tricky. And over time, you're going to start falling into things that you like. You're going to start doing the duties that you like the most, and you could spend days or weeks or so much more doing all the stuff that you really like without actually taking in mind the player. And over time, you might start to think you just are an analog for the player, and what you say is probably right, and there's no need to actually bring players into the experience. But let me, <laughs> let me just let you know right now that that's not true. You need to play test to ground yourself. You have to put it in front of players and listen to what they have to say. And I say this because I have actually um, heard this before in many different playtests that I've been in, where um, some form of, I didn't find this aspect particularly fun, and they will respond with, well, I mean, you just did it wrong. Like, it is fun, you, you just didn't play it right, or something like that. But that's the thing, you can't tell the person experiencing their game that their experience was invalid. Um, you can't just shoot back and say, well, it's, it's not important if you found it fun, um, unless I guess they're completely outside of your target demographic. Then, sure, uh, maybe, maybe it isn't that important. But keep in mind, if someone gives you feedback, it's your duty to kind of take that in, understand it, and recognize that as the advocate for the player, you should be fighting for the rest of the team or to the rest of the team. Like, well, we should be finding ways to improve this experience if it makes sense to you as the designer. So... What skills do you need to bolster in order to do this? Well, you need to be able to withstand empathy under pressure. You have to see things from the player experience and they're going to be antagonistic and there's going to be time deadlines. There's going to be budgets. There's going to be all sorts of crazy stuff. And you need to be able to face that reality maturely. You need to be able to see that things are the way they are and you can't just sit on it and complain about it and try to adjust reality, you just have to do your best with what you have. So 
you need to be able to see these constraints not as limiting factors that if you could just change the constraints, everything would be better. Do your best under the constraint. And a lot of those constraints are going to come from other disciplines. And as the game designer, we talked about this in the previous lecture, everybody is designing the game in some capacity. Every little detail goes into the overall player experience. So as the game designer, you probably more so than just about anyone else on the team are going to have to communicate across many different disciplines. You're going to have to be able to change your language so that you can communicate with the artists, with the production team, with the developers, with QA, with the marketing team, with the publisher, whatever it is. You're going to have to be able to communicate across all of them and let them know what your design is without getting too caught up in technical terminology. And then of course, you're going to need to let those other people's skills shine. And you might have the opinion that, oh, I need to have total control over everything. But trust me, as soon as you learn to be able to relinquish some of that control over to people who are very skilled and talented at what they do, far more skilled and talented than you will be at those disciplines, you can let them really shine. And hopefully you can develop a good enough relationship that you can start still having design influence to some extent, still making sure things are moving in the right direction while letting them be their best self, if you will. And then finally, you need to be able to take on inspiration from a broad set of different experiences. At the kind of post-lecture chat, we were talking about what electives might be valuable to you. And I personally think that there is a really big push for let's see you go into history and art and philosophy and cognitive science and the sciences and um, all of these different things. I personally took a lot of film and English philosophy, psychology, cognitive science, all these different disciplines that just exposed me to new ideas. I really like this expression when it comes to the skills of a game designer. You need strong opinions held weekly. You need to be able to defend your idea. You need to understand your idea well enough to be confident in it. But you also need to be open to change as soon as new evidence comes in. As soon as a play tester or a bunch of play testers or as soon as you realize that some aspect of the game isn't working how you originally hoped it would, then you need to be ready to relinquish that, uh, that opinion. So now, what does the actual role of a game, de game designer look like? What are you doing when you're sitting down to design a game? And you might be thinking, oh, it's an idea. I just need to have an idea for a game and then I sit down and make it. And sure, that's a way that you can make a game, but a big part of what it means to be a game designer is the process you take. And everybody is going to take on a different process, but effectively what any game design process has at its core is this basic framework. You're going to set a goal for what you think the player should experience. You need something in mind. The clearer the idea of this overall player experience that you want them to have, the better. You're going to define the rules of that experience. You're going to sit down and actually think like, okay, so if I want that experience to happen, there needs to be some stuff to actually let the player do that and get to that point. You need to then be able to take those rules, take that experience that you've built and evaluate if it's actually in line with the goal that you have. You want to then evolve your design, bring it closer, and then you actually adjust that goal afterwards. You don't want to stick to a goal just because it's what you originally had in mind and you need to make that thing that you really like. No. Instead, you want to slowly adjust your goal. You play test with a bunch of people. You find something interesting. So you say, you know what? Maybe that first game wasn't actually the best, but maybe this new game, this slight change to that game, maybe that's what's best. And you try to refine your goal until eventually you find the fun game in all that mess. Now, if we want to boil this down to something a lot simpler, I think we could readily describe the game designer role as asking questions, asking the right questions, providing answers, and then evaluating those answers realistically, and then figuring out what new questions need to be asked and prioritizing everything so that you're answering the right questions at the right time. Now, as a game designer, we have this problem. We're trying to design an experience. We're trying to get the player to do something and put them in some kind of place and state of mind, but we can't actually directly affect that state of mind. So instead, we need to design the rules and the underlying mechanics that are going to get us there. But that's a problem because designing mechanics is not designing an experience. An experience involves much more than that. Instead, we're only 
really able to evaluate an experience, how good is it, by actually experiencing it. Which brings us to a fundamental rule, which is that games can only be improved through play. We can only actually sit down and try to improve something or think about our design realistically if it exists, if there is something there that we can make. And if you've sat down to software projects in previous courses or in anything before, you may realize that the actual making can take a while. It can take time. You can get bogged down. And if you invest a whole lot of time into a project, you're really unlikely to want to just trash it and throw it away as soon as somebody says, well, that's no good. So we need to actually be playing something, but we also don't want to sit down and just think our way through. We don't want to try and plan the ultimate thing so that when we sit down to play it and invest that time into making it, it's phenomenal up front. We don't want to waste that time thinking, and we also don't want to waste all of that time making. So how do we do it? Well, we start with something that passes as a game. I mean, we just, we figure out what makes a game a game, and then we make something that passes as it. And then we improve it, we define it, we cement that game as what it is. And we go through that process. We ask questions and we answer them. We have to come up with concrete answers for any question that we come up with. That is our role as a game designer. We don't let those questions hang unless they actually aren't important to the game. So this course, um, basically everything, if you're looking into game design, is really about these three aspects, these three major pillars, I, uh, I believe, at least, uh, which is we need to learn which questions to ask and when is the implication there. We need to have as many answers as possible and be able to generate new answers. That means that we need to build up our toolbox. We need to build up our vocabulary. You need to play a lot of games, but play them intentionally enough that you can recognize what patterns they're doing, what things they have in them so that you can add them to your toolkit. So that when you ask a question, you can pull from an existing answer instead of having to sit there and do the research on them. But you should probably still sit there and do some research anyway. And then, of course, we need to understand how to evaluate the answers. And this is somewhere that a lot of people get really hung up on. This is somewhere that people tend to forget. They know what questions to ask because they've played a lot of games and they question those games all the time. They build up their set of answers by going to conferences and talking to people and making games and very intentionally logging things. But then when it comes to actually evaluating if it's fun, if it's good for players, that's an entire field of things that they just skip until far too late to actually make any use of that feedback or you don't really know how to interpret it. Maybe you go down trying to say, oh, well, they said this, so I have to make this change or they said that um, and it was no good. So let's not bother with that. Their feedback is no good. You find yourself at some end of the extremes of taking in way too much feedback or not enough feedback. And either way, it's a process that you're going to learn over time. Just remember the overall goals of a game designer. Advocate for the player. Give the player the best experience possible. Give as many players the best experience possible. Whatever your goals are for the player experience, remember that, keep it in mind, and use that to help you evaluate those answers better. So I want to go through an example here with the class, and um, if you're just watching this on your own, go through it on your own time. Let's say that we have this basic, basic goal in mind, and it's not an amazing problem statement, but it's going to get us by for this early design. We have two players, and they're fighting to acquire territory. What questions must be answered first? Try to think of what questions we need to answer to get this to be a game. But remember that we want to do it fast. We want to do it minimal. We just want to pass as a game. So what do we need to do to pass as a game for this? Think about those questions briefly. Let's go. So here's a little example that I just whipped up as I was going. And this was my process. I did this while I wrote these slides. So who knows, might not be any good. We have two players fighting to acquire territory. Let's think about, well, where are the territories? What are they fighting over? So let's just start with a basic 10 by 10 grid. So we have a 10 by 10 grid. Uh, maybe it's a checkerboard pattern, just, I don't know. Maybe we'll use it, maybe we won't. Now, we have to think about time. Um, our 
turns handled kind of back and forth or are we playing at the exact same time? Is it synchronous or asynchronous? So I'm going to say it's back and forth. Uh, so the first player is, I don't know, whoever explored something new recently. We just have to figure that out. So let's go with that. Now, we might want to consider the theme at this point, and I've put an asterisk next to this because maybe you don't need a theme for the gameplay. But I always find in my design processes that coming up with some kind of a theme, even if I throw that theme away and go with a completely different one after the fact, it helps me think about experiences that I want to design. It helps me think about real world systems and things that I've experienced. And I can then start using those for influence. And I can start using those to come up with new game mechanics or to make sense of things. So I really like coming up with a theme early, even if I completely throw it away and change it out later. So let's just come up with a theme based on me having a cat around. So sibling cats are fighting for their owner's attention. And I don't know, that kind of sparks an idea. Maybe it's some sort of King of the Hill game, like they're fighting over a bed or something. I don't know. I'll, I'll pocket that idea. It seems like it would work really cool for the theme, but I'm just going to pocket that one because um, it's not quite in territory acquisition where my head is, but I do want to think about that. So then we have uh, the interaction. If we have a place, if we know how turns are handled, we have a rough idea of a theme, then we want to start thinking, so what are the players actually doing? What are the interactions that they're doing? So in this case, really what we have to ask is how does the player acquire a territory? If that's the entire goal of the game, how does a player acquire a territory? So let's say cards. Uh, that's, that's what we're going to use. The mechanic is we have cards, and let's think about some other mechanics that we can do with those cards. What, what does it mean to have a hand of cards? Well, we have to start uh, filling in the blanks. We don't have a game yet, but we have a board. We have two people holding onto cards back and forth to each other. Um, now what? Well, we can say start at opposite corners. I don't know why. Let's just start at opposite corners. Games do that. So we're sitting at opposite corners from one another. And we each have cards, but we need to define. What cards do we have? Let's just say that we have 1 to 5 uh, red and 1 to 5 black. Because... Maybe in a territory acquisition game, we'll want to move and acquire territory as two separate actions. We could consider it one action, two actions. I think moving and acquiring seem like two things. So I'm going to give you two different resources in your hands that you can use for different purposes. So we'll say red will move you around the board and black will place sense. Now, um, we'll like place a sense by... Um, playing down that black card, and we'll just write down how much scent you have. Maybe we'll find a more elegant interaction for that later. Why scent? It came out of nowhere? Because it came out of nowhere. And I said, well, uh, I've had some experience in ant colony optimization algorithms. I've seen how ants move around and leave scents all over the place. And I've seen my cat rub up against everything in the house uh, kind of crazily. So uh, cats lay down scents, so that's the territory we're acquiring. Okay, so naturally we have to ask, how do you actually place, uh, place that scent? Well, you can move, you can place a sense, you can add a scent to a location multiple times. That's a mechanic. We'll say, if you put down a uh, black card, like a five to put down a sense, then on your next turn, you can put down a two to put that down. Um, can we move and place sense on the same turn? Uh, let's limit it to one action. Uh, so you can only play one or the other. That's a question, and we answered it. Can you override sense if you play a higher card? Yeah, yeah, I think that's the right route. So we can uh, play down. If we play a higher card than the opponent, then we take over that area. We replace it with our sense. But if we play a lower card, we'll just... It doesn't do anything. They still have the dominant sense, so we can't override their sense with a lower card. I think that's a good mechanic. And then when uh, when... We run out of cards, we have an even amount of cards, so we'll end at the same time, then we'll end the game. And whoever wins will be whoever has the most squares. We won't take the sum of cents because you start with the same numbers. We'll just take whoever has the, uh, the most total number of squares. And now we can play. Now we have a victory condition. We are aiming to have the most number of squares. We have a starting hand. We have um, this interaction of placing down cents and moving. So we have two really big interactions. Um, we have some other stuff that comes out of that, like we're overriding each other's sense. We're not just placing them all over the place. We have a 10 by 10 board to move around. So we have everything that we need there to just sit down and play. 
So this, I came up with it in, I think, five minutes. Um, when I was actually writing these slides, it took around five minutes, and we had something that we could sit down and start playing. So that's where we want to get to. When you're making your games in the tutorials, when you're making games is just like a little prototype challenge, make a game that passes as a game. And you know what? This might not be any fun. Maybe you can barely even interact with each other because the board is too big. Maybe the hex grid isn't, or maybe the square grid isn't interesting, so you want to switch to a hex grid. Maybe being on this at all doesn't work very well, and we actually want to uh, reskin it. Maybe it would be more fun if it was themed. Maybe we place uh, random furniture around and we can interact with that. But before we start going crazy with all those ideas, let's even see if this has anything fun. So we play it and we find out what the boring part was. Let's just say we played it and we found out that we didn't have enough cards. Like uh, you run out of cards and the round is done and it's really boring. So the next thing that we need to do is figure out, okay, that's the one issue that we want to fix this time around. So if there wasn't enough rounds for us to play, then maybe we can bring cards back into our hand somehow. Maybe we can throw away our hand to get new ones back. I don't know. We have to come up with some solution for it. So we fix it. We come up with a quick rule change and we play it again and we see if it improved or not. And if it improved, awesome. What's the next thing that we're going to fix? And we just keep repeating that process over and over again. This is the process of iterative work, uh, game design. And you can read more about it in uh, Game Design Workshop 16 to 21 or the entire book, because this is really what it's about. Um, in digital games, we tend to start with paper prototypes. Even if we're making a video game, a first person shooter or something, we're probably still going to work with a paper prototype first because paper is a lot easier to program than a computer. <laughs> so we could just pull out a piece of paper, sketch some stuff. If we've got our cards and dice and stuff around us, we could just pull those out and start playing. And any time that we ask this question, we don't have to program anything. We just come up with an answer and keep playing. So it's really nice to help us find these questions while we're playing without having to, and be able to answer them immediately without having to sit down and program for a day or two to actually get that answer. So starting with paper helps us really develop the what our game is, and then we can move on from there to uh, software when we actually have a firm grasp of the answers to all of these fundamental questions. And of course, there's still going to be questions. As a game designer, you ask questions and you answer them. But the fundamental questions, the ones that will permeate your entire game, you really want to answer as early as possible. Okay, so moving on from that, let's actually talk about what a game is. Because if we need something that passes as a game, let me just check, okay. If we need something that passes as a game, then we need to understand what exactly makes a game. So this whole lecture for the, uh, from this point on, we're going to be looking at this question. Now, something that's um, also worth mentioning, over the course, I'm going to be talking a lot about lens. And in one of the course textbooks, Art of Game Design, A Book of Lenses, we have this maybe more formal thinking, and if you're just looking at lenses through the lens of this book, then you might think that lens is this coined term, something that's very official, and there is this Bible of lenses that we have to follow. But really, it's just meaning that we are looking at something from a perspective. Uh, we're looking at it, kind of tunnel visioning ourselves to think, Right now, all I'm thinking about is this lens. All I'm thinking about are these questions. And you're examining it through that so that you can get a distinct answer. And then maybe you look at it again through a different lens and a different lens and a different lens. And then maybe you take a step back and you try to see how it all connects. But even that is itself a lens. How does everything come together is a lens. So there is this book of specific lenses and I'm going to do my best to um, like show you it, which lenses I'm referring to it as best as I can at least. But check out the textbook. It gives you a lot of fantastic uh, questions to ask about your games, fantastic lenses to examine different aspects of your game through. And there's even an app. So if you want to look it up, I think it's called um, an app of lenses or something like that. Um, and it's fantastic. It's free. And you can check out all of the lenses in one handy, handy dandy phone app. And in fact, you can hit a shuffle button, pull a random lens up, and it'll just have like five questions that you can ask about something. So if you're sitting there and you don't really know what to do this play test, you can hit shuffle, pull up a random card, 
and maybe you'll get some cool answers. It'll give you questions to answer. So I want to pose a question to you to think about. Is driving a game? Consider that. Think about what this implies. To you and your definition of a game, is driving, just driving a car, is that a game? Well, let's start looking into the definition of games, um, at least some of the formal definitions. And I want to be clear, I don't want to get caught up in formal definitions. I, actually, I really don't think technical definitions of uh, things are particularly important, but really we want to understand the spirit of it. We want to think about what is common across these and build up a, a feeling for what a game is more than anything. So let's consider a game as something that you play. Okay, so that's a pretty vague definition, but it gives us this. Okay, now what is play? Well, Shell poses play as this manipulation indulging curiosity. And when we think about that, um, my microphone has some play here, this leg. I can move it back and forth and I just hope that it's not destroying my recording. Um, this has some play. This water bottle has some play. And it indulges curiosity, the, the change in friction. Will this flip or will it stay in place? The little click that you get when it reaches the end. You're interested. You're seeing what happens. You're like a cat batting a ball around. You're just looking to see what happens and you're playing with it. Now, what is a toy in that case? Well, if a game is something you play, then it's reasonable to say that a toy is something that you would play with. And there's something different between those two statements, something you play and something you play with. Um, so we'll, we'll dig into these a little bit more, but if playing with a toy or playing with something makes it a toy, then I mean, a good toy is something fun to play with. A good game would be something fun to play. And maybe there's an asterisk because we aren't always looking for fun in a game, but we, I think this is a reasonable statement. Now, what is fun? Huge question, um, but I, I do like this definition from Shell in the textbook. Fun is pleasure with surprises. So it's a good feeling. It's something that you enjoy doing and there's surprises throughout. So if you're doing something that you enjoy, but there's no surprise, there's no nothing kind of interesting happening outside of that enjoyable thing, like eating food. Um, eating food isn't particularly fun, but if you get a bag of Birdie Bot's Every Flavored Beans, suddenly it can be kind of fun because you don't know what you're about to eat and you get shocked when you eat it. So I would say that's one of the big differences between um, or that's one good case towards fun being by this definition, but maybe you can come up with some negative cases here. Either way, it's a good working definition and surprise is absolutely a major aspect of what can make these experiences enjoyable. So let's not get too stuck on the more academic side of things, but I do wanna bring them up and you can read over them uh, for yourself and see if any of them click. So we have this one. Um, where we're talking about voluntary control. It's a contest between two powers. And at the end of the day, uh, there's different outcomes. I think all of that is really strong. Now we have um, a game is interactive. That's important. That's an important aspect of that. It's endogenous. So um, it has endogenous meaning. That is, there is value in the game. And there is value just for the sake of the game. There is, you don't rely on extrinsic or external forces to make the game interesting. It has value in itself. And you are struggling towards a goal. And there's quite a lot to unpack in there. You are struggling, there's conflict, and there's a goal. There's something you're trying to accomplish. Now, when we boil it down, this description says that it's about independent decision-making, trying to achieve objectives, limiting context, so you can't do everything possible. You have some limitations, some barriers in place. We have it's a free activity, it's not serious, it's connected with no material interest, so it's endogenous. 
It has its own boundaries. It has fixed rules. So we're seeing a lot of common themes popping up in all of these definitions that do relate back to that original idea of something we're playing, something that's fun. And I think this is a good set of pillars for what really makes a game. And we can stretch a lot of these definitions quite a bit. So it's entered willfully. It has goals. It has conflict. It has rules. It could be won and lost. It's interactive. There's challenge. All of these things are very important. Um, but again, we can stretch these definitions. There's a lot of games that aren't competitive games, but they're still limiting you. They're still pushing you. They're still asking you to do something without a clear and obvious answer. So there is still a form of conflict, even in less gamey games, if you will. Now, that's why I like this final definition. And this is one that I really appreciate in, um, in the textbook, but it's one that I've tried to stick with which is a game is a problem-solving activity approached with a playful attitude. And I quite like that. Um, it's very important that a game is entered into willfully and playfully. You did it because you wanted to achieve some sort of particular experience, usually fun or some em emotional evocation. So we approach it with a playful attitude and we treat it as a problem-solving activity. In essence, a game is meant to teach. We solve problems and we learn from the problems that we solve. They're testing us and they're testing us on information that they themselves are teaching us. They're a problem to be solved and they're one that the player willfully wants to solve. So we ask again, is driving a game? I would probably argue that driving isn't a game because it's not really limited in scope. Um, <laughs> You could do anything, but it would be a really bad time. There's extrinsic value. So you are doing it for a purpose. You're doing it for a reason um, that is outside of it for itself. Uh, now, uh, sure, there might be other, other motivators here. Maybe you're driving just for fun. And if you're driving just for fun and you've built up some kind of obstacles in place, you can make driving into a game, absolutely. That's why there's a whole driving genre, but still it's within the real world. It has major ramifications if things go wrong, extrinsic ramifications if things go wrong. So there's a lot of good arguments that maybe driving is not a game. Now, that's one way to think about games, just by their definition. But we need to start breaking games down into their individual elements. We need to start choosing our lenses. And... At different points, we may want to take on different lenses, different perspectives. We want to wear different hats. Are we looking at our game as an engineer? Are we looking at it as an experience designer or a content designer or a player or a producer or in marketing or wherever we are? And what you want to do is start building up the vocabulary to be able to see it from different perspectives, obviously from a design perspective, but you need to be able to see how all these different elements work together and harmonize. So part of the skill of being a game designer is knowing when and what perspective or what perspective you should take when. And it's something that is really just learned through practice. It can make getting started difficult because you might be looking at it as a developer, as a computer science student. But then you start looking at it as a designer and maybe you get really deep into content design and you're thinking, okay, well, we need to do this world building, this world building, this world building. And then you get player feedback that says, um, all of that narrative got in the way. I just wanted to play the game more. And now you have to look at it maybe as an experienced designer <laughs> and say, okay, so the experience is a bit broken here. So we want to fix the experience. So what can we do to repair that? And you need to know when to swap skill sets. So um, as an extension of this, we need to think about the overall harmony of your game because all of these different skills are contributing to the underlying harmony of things. So we need to consider um, this problem, which maybe you actually haven't experienced this. If you haven't played a ton of kind of non AAA, extremely well polished games, you may not have experienced this, but have you ever played a game where things just felt off and didn't make sense? And when you saw stuff, you got completely ripped out of the game and you were going, what is happening here? Um, usually that's chalked up because there wasn't a lot of harmony and two kind of hilarious example 
a lot of games just didn't care about harmonizing their elements very much. So in this case, I just want to pull up a couple of examples that I've seen on Game Grumps. So we had Bugs Bunny Birthday Blowout, where you are Bugs Bunny going around hitting blocks, which are carrots that turn into the Warner Brothers logo, fighting clocks and hammers, trying not to fall on spikes while going into tubes made of stone um, so that you can get to your birthday. Not a lot of harmony there. <laughs> it's using a lot of mechanics that don't have anything to do with Bugs Bunny and are in fact pulled quite extensively from Mario. Even the pipe design is directly out of Mario. Um, you're fighting enemies that don't make a lot of sense to the game. And just lots of aspects of the aesthetic just don't work. I mean, Bugs Bunny falling on a bunch of, spark, uh, of sharp spikes is not something that I think a lot of people who watch Bugs Bunny would expect to see. Um, and then we have this just absolutely fantastic example here, uh, which maybe works as a game because of how unharmonious it is, which is the home improvement game Power Tool Pursuit, where you play Tim Allen traveling through time fighting dinosaurs with power tools. Um, just, just wonderful. But they actually did try to harmonize to an extent, which I think is why this game works a little bit better. Because you're going around collecting, like, I think, lug nuts. Um, you are, <laughs> you're using all sorts of power tools to defeat the enemies. The, a bunch of the aesthetic is actually pulled from the show, and they use scenes from the show uh, as kind of gameplay motivation. It's hilarious. Certain aspects are harmonized, certain aspects aren't. And you can actually use this to your benefit. Some games that don't harmonize do it very intentionally, and it works. But you need to understand how maybe it's a bit jarring to your player when certain aspects don't harmonize. Now, if you want to harmonize, there's a ton that you can look at, but one really nice framework that we can use is this elemental tetrad, which is lens number nine in the book. And uh, you don't need to memorize this exactly. You don't need to know that the elemental tetrad is these four things. But you should have a general notion that a game consists at a very high level of the technology. It consists of the rules, the mechanics that the player or that the player is interacting with. There's some kind of story, whether it's the actual story in the game or the story that the player is telling to themselves about the game that they're playing. And there's the overall aesthetic of the game, which is what's the um, the look, the feel, the theming uh, means to the player. So all of these different aspects must be present for a game to exist. Basically, I mean, you need all of these for a game to happen. This is just what a game is broken down. And I did want to put an, a an asterisk here because we're going to be talking about a different kind of aesthetic in the next lecture. And I just want you to recognize there are two major uses of this throughout game design. So be aware we're talking about the look, the sound, the feel, the story uh, in this case. And this is also a useful framework because it shows us where people are coming from, uh, from different perspectives. So players sit up in the aesthetics Programmers sit down on the technology, and the designers should really be thinking about the, the story, the player story that's happening at any given moment. Um, again, whether that's what story is being told in the game or what story the player is telling themselves, because this directly impacts everything else. And the mechanics, the underlying rules and things in the game that the player is actually working with. So the designer sits in that middle, but all of these elements harmonize with each other. If the aesthetic doesn't work for the mechanics, it doesn't work. If you can't accomplish that aesthetic on that technology, then you just simply can't make that happen. If the technology doesn't support your gameplay mechanics, then you shouldn't be using it. Um, if you've played a lot of board games, you've probably experienced some games that are finicky, that are hard to deal with, that require a lot of bookkeeping, and you have to figure out um, strategies just on how to play the game because it takes so long to interact with. And maybe that's an example of the technology not harmonizing well with the mechanics because you're trying to do mechanics that just don't work with the technology that you presented. So we need to look at these things uh, as a harmonizing experiment. So we have those four aspects and that's great, but under that is the underlying structure of the game. What makes a game a game at a more fundamental elemental level. 
Well, let's ask a question that was posed in chapter two of Game Design Workshop. How are Quake and Go Fish similar? And maybe take a moment to consider that. Don't just listen, take, take a second to pause and consider it. How are the games Quake and Go Fish similar? If you don't know Quake, just think about any big first person shooter, an active competitive first person shooter um, where a bunch of people are, well, going for the kill. How are the card game Go Fish and the first person shooter Quake similar? Well, they both have players. That might seem kind of insignificant, but there's players interacting with some experience that's quite different from film and books where the viewers, the readers are just passive observers in this experience. Maybe there's a story going on in their head, but they're technically passive to all of this. The goals are present. So they have very different goals, uh, Go Fish and Quake, but you're still trying to accomplish something in this experience. They have procedures. Both of them have to provide you with some instructions. Go Fish writes out the instructions and asks you to enforce them. Whereas Quake presents you with the instructions. It lets you know what things you can do and then it enforces those rules uh, through software. There are those rules, the things that actually interpret um, what the player is acting on. And again, programmed or enforced by the people around the table, still rules being followed. We have resources, we have things that are of value to the player. We can extrapolate resources and we will in a future uh, lecture. Resources can be quite a lot in a game, but there's just something of value. We have obstacles, something that presents some conflict, something that gets in the way of you accomplishing your goal, otherwise it would be a very boring game. And finally, we have some outcome that we're seeking. And it may not be a crazy diverse amount of outcomes, but maybe there's some way to succeed, some way to fail, some way to get all of the information, some way to get some of the information, some way to gain full understanding of everything that's happening in this story, and some way to have a more limited perspective on the story. Again, this is different from watching a movie or uh, reading a book because there's one outcome. You've read the whole thing and you are presented with everything. Maybe you technically have a different outcome because you skipped a couple of pages, you forgot a chapter, and you have no idea what that uh, character was saying. But that's not really the intention of the book, necessarily. <laughs> so this gives us a couple of uh, approaches. This structure helps us to actually make the game. So first, we want to decide the goal and the possible conclusions. What are we trying to accomplish here? Um, and how can you, or like, what are the alternatives for success? Win conditions, for example. What actions and procedures will actually get us to the goal? Um, what resources or rules are involved in those actions? So if we have things that we can do, there needs to be ramifications for those. So what are the ramifications of those actions that we're taking? Um, and what resources are involved in that? Because typically an action will involve some exchange of resources, even if it's a, a softer resource like time and attention. And then once we have that, once we've established those aspects, the things that we can do, why we're doing them, and the ways that that will happen in the game, the consequences of those, we do have a game. We can stop right there and we have a game. We can take actions, we can do stuff, we can work towards a goal, um, but it's probably not a very good game. There's no real conflict introduced innately. Um, so we can start by adding obstacles. We can add interactions between the players if we have more than one player. We can do stuff to help the player overcome those uh, obstacles. If we introduce a new thing, we may need new ways for them to uh, overcome it. Or we can find new ways to make use of our previous actions to overcome obstacles in interesting ways. And now we have a bit, of a bit of a better game. And there's way more that we can add. We can add sensation. We can aim for a particular type of fun that we want the player to experience. And we can start changing things to promote that. But at the end of the day, these are the fundamental building blocks that will lead us to that final experience. So as a class, let's go to a breakout room. We are going to watch the uh, start of Star Realms. We're going to look at the overview of how the game Star Realms plays. And then I would like you all to break apart um, the elemental tetrad. So try to consider the story, the aesthetics, the mechanics, the tech. 
Think about what that means to the game Star Realms, and then consider the structural elements. Consider the resources, the goals, the actions the player can take, what's getting in the way of the player accomplishing their goals, and finally, what are some of the rules in play. Um, I put that one at the end because there's a lot of rules, and so just um, consider the other ones first and then consider the rules later. Okay, so for the final framework of today, we are going to look at games as loops. So games are about learning and problem solving. We've talked about that earlier. Um, but how do we actually learn new things? If that's what games are, then we should probably start there. How do we learn things? How do we problem solve? And I think a good place to look at this is the scientific method. It's something that we've developed specifically to solve, uh, solve problems and learn new things about the world around us. So we start by observing or posing some kind of a question. Then we do a bunch of research in the area. We try to gather as much knowledge as we can. We form some hypothesis. We say, I think that this is what will happen based off of the research I've done. We do some experiments to test that and collect data. We get that data and we analyze it. We see what we're actually being told. We posed a question, we posed a hypothesis, and now we're seeing what we're actually being told and we report on our conclusions. And then that gives us new questions. So that sounds awfully similar to designing a game, doesn't it? We pose a problem. Uh, let's make a two-player territorial acquisition game. And then we pose some, well, we do research. We take in all the things that we have in our brain. Maybe we look at other territorial acquisition games and see what mechanics they use. Then we form a hypothesis. We form a prototype, uh, a paper prototype that tries to get across that two-player territorial acquisition. We play test it. That's our experiment. We analyze the playtest data, and then we reform our problem statement and come up with a new game. So the scientific method is very much how we design games as well. This is how we do a lot of creativity, really, uh, when we make a couple of small changes to this. But it's also how we um, play games. It's also what we're doing when we play games. We have this overall structure. We form a goal. We take into account our knowledge, we form some intention, we take action on that intention, we receive feedback from our action, and we update our overall knowledge base and form a new goal. Or maybe we reform what that original goal was. If we want to boil it down, um, but we start with the mental model, we have some idea of what the game looks like or what we're being asked to do, and everybody is going to come in with a different mental model. And that mental model is going to change over the course of playing the game. They're going to take some action. So they need to know what actions they can take, and then they're going to take some action. They're going to let the rules happen, so either players are going to enforce the rules around the table, or the game is going to do some processing. And now, ideally, they're receiving strong feedback to let them know what the rules did. They're receiving strong feedback to know if they did good or if they did bad, and then they're going to update their model from that. So let's take a closer look at each element. This mental model is all about the things they're coming into the game with and what you have trained them to know. So what skills do they have? What context do they have for the game or things like this game? What actions can they possibly take? And they need to have all this in mind in order to actually move forward. They need to know what goal they're working towards. They need to know if there's sub goals to accomplish that goal. So they need to have a very firm mental model of what they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, um, and what they might be able to do. They need to be able to take action. That means that the actual action can be skillful or mindful. There's different kinds of actions that we can take. You need to know what actions they are. They need to have some way of actually doing that interaction. Um, so they need to be able to take that action. Um, and again, in order to do that, they have to know what actions are available. Then the rules are applied, and this is where we need consistently applied rules so that they know they can start to predict how their actions will affect the game. They are using their kind of feedback from the rules to start building up a stronger mental model of what the rules imply. They're trying to basically do a little bit of game design in their head so that they can say, well, I took this action, and this was the result, 
So that must mean that the rules are asking me to play in this way. And they'll start playing a little bit more in that way. And then finally, the all important feedback. This is something that I have seen so many people miss. This is vitally important that they receive some form of feedback for their action. They need to know if they're moving in the right direction or the wrong direction. They need to know if that thing that they tried to do was right or wrong. Um, and this is a place that most people miss. So um, I highly encourage you when you're playing a game next to sit down and try to think about all of the sources of feedback that you see. Think about the particle effects that pop out when you uh, do something in the game to let you know that that happened. Think about the click sound when you move from left to right in a menu to let you know you successfully moved left or right. Think about the uh, shimmering sounds, the menu moving away, the screen going black. All that's telling you that stuff is happening, that you took actions and there were results for it. Pay attention to visual audio feedback, um, feedback in what resources the game provides you. If it's giving you a ton of gold, then you probably know that that's a good action. If it's taking away a ton of health, then you know that's something you need to avoid. So think about what kinds of feedback the game is providing you. So uh, let's actually see that in action. We're going to just take a moment to look at Super Mario 1-1 and see how it makes use of this loop to actually uh, get players to do what they want you to do. So take a moment to check that out. One thing that we can ponder then, we've talked about how we use the game loop to promote these experiences, but how exactly can the game loop go wrong? Uh, I want everyone to have a small chat here to think about what happens when the game loop breaks, when your mental model is wrong, when you can't take an action, when the rules seem wrong, when feedback is wrong. Um, I just want, if you have some experience where you feel like the loop has broken, uh, mention it in chat or put up your hand and let's, let's chat about it. Okay. So I don't think we're going to have a lot of time. If we do have some extra time, then we'll come back to this. But um, this video, that uh, you can find here, Rasputin, what games are like for someone who doesn't play games. There are some excellent examples in here of seeing what happens when the game loop breaks. Because when we're making games for people who have never played games before, we have to be very careful where the mental model that they have coming into the game isn't the same as someone who is experienced with games. We have to be much more careful because small feedback problems can actually train their mental model to be completely wrong for the rest of the game. And they won't understand why it's wrong because that's baked into their mental model. So I highly suggest taking some time to check this out if we don't have time by the end of class. So important with loops are that they don't stick to just one loop. We don't just have the game loop and that's it. Instead, loops come at us in different frequencies. We have big loops, we have small loops, we have middle-sized loops, we have loops at all over the place. Games are all about looping. Broadly, we can think of it as the second-by-second -second interactions. This is your um, kind of core loop. This is the action that you are constantly taking. And the core loop can extend out to be bigger, but overall, this is, for the rest of the game, what is the player doing every single time through the loop? Now, at the, the medium level, um, and this will be different game to game. These are the higher level tasks. These are the higher level skills that you're going to be picking up and maybe even leaving behind once you're done uh, going through that loop. Once you've mastered it, you may not even touch that uh, skill again, or maybe it's going to pop up in a different loop. But typically we consider this like a level or learning a particular puzzle type or just some higher order uh, skill. And then we have various different lengths of longer loops. Maybe the entire game is a loop. Maybe there are some longer term goals that are recurring, or maybe uh, you consider an actual full level. Like maybe the middle loop for you is a room and then the full level is many, many rooms being completed. And okay, it's worth mentioning briefly as well, but we're not going to talk about it too, too much is that um, arcs exist and they're basically loops that don't loop back on themselves. They provide you with a massive feedback dump once you've performed these, and that's it. But usually these consist of little loops on the way of the arc. And this is where you'll see like a movie is one big arc from beginning to end with little sub arcs all throughout. 
Um, you have kind of act one, act two, act three, but all of this is one big arc uh, for the characters or for the plot. And games have these all the time, naturally, where we have this big buildup and then a huge release right at the ends where we get lots of cool feedback, maybe a flashy boss fight. Uh, maybe we've been completing a really long series of things in a level and then we get a really satisfying, juicy ending. Um, so these happen quite often and it's worth being aware of it, but we're not going to consider this too, too much in the course. We're just going to talk about uh, loops more. <laughs> so to do some examples of loops, let's go through the Binding of Isaac and uh, I'm going to play this really quickly and go through um, what I think is the breakdown of this loop. So for Binding of Isaac, I consider the overall game loop to basically be go into a room, kill all the enemies, loot the corpses, go into other rooms, find unique items in stores, get more powerful, beat a boss, and then repeat all that. And that's what you're doing in the game. If we boil it down, that's what you're doing. Um, but this is kind of hard to picture. So instead, we are going to start thinking about the immediate problems, and then we're going to think about the category of clearing an individual room. We're going to categorize it as clearing a floor and then clearing an entire game. And a key thing that we want to be asking ourselves is, what is the goal of this loop? What, it, what does the character want to accomplish at this loop? And let the action that they're taking be the answer to that question, uh, to the, uh, that goal. So I like to boil it down like this. We have these major categories that we built for ourselves. Um, the immediate loop I'm calling run, kill, collect. So our goal is to run, kill, and collect things. And there's a lot of questions that are asked. And this is one of the value, uh, valuable aspects of breaking this thing apart is what does the loop ask? Should I be running past this enemy? Should, what even is that enemy? What does this item do? Can I kill this? How do I kill this? Can I reach that thing? How much health do I have left? Oh, all of these questions are running through the player's mind. And it's important to pay attention to these because if you ask too many questions at once, it can overwhelm the player. If you're not asking enough questions, then it's probably going to get boring. We'll talk about that next week. But we need to keep these questions in mind. And if you don't have any interesting questions, then maybe reconsider including that loop at all. Once we get to just base survival, uh, once we get past that, we start thinking about clearing an entire room like we saw. So. Are there secrets in this room? Do I have enough bombs to actually get everything in here? Do I need to come back to this room? What rooms does this connect to? Is there any valuable loot in this room? So we can start thinking about different questions, questions that are maybe a bit more compound or stretch out to other things a bit more cleanly. And then we want to clear the floor and we ask different questions. Have I gotten all the secrets? Have I explored every room? And then Within that, I mean, there's all sorts of little loops that will also be training, skills that we want to be training at any given time. We want to teach them to look for secret rooms. We want to teach them to take the more efficient paths throughout. We want to teach them how to accomplish the boss fight at the end. So this might be composed of little smaller loops, but the broad categorization helps us with the overall questions that we wanted asking. And then Binding of Isaac actually took the approach of turning the entire game into a loop. So it's not an arc. It doesn't give you a big feedback dump at the end and then that's it. Instead, it provides you with new characters. It gives you statistics so that you can improve your timing or play it in a different way. Um, it offers randomization so you don't always get the same items as you progress. So now you're asking, well, what items might I get next time? What new items are available that I haven't seen yet? So it's lots of questions being asked at any given time. And if you're Doing a loop without any questions, it's going to be boring. So consider the questions. There are so many things that we can, uh, we can break this apart. But if we go back to our key breakdowns, if we go back to our key game structure, we also see it at this level. We can apply any lens to it. What's surprising about the loop? What goals does this loop have? What interactions are in this loop? What resources are in the loop? What themes are in this loop? We can ask ourselves, all of these questions ad nauseum, any question you like, but by breaking apart into loops, we can actually start tunnel visioning on these sorts of questions. We can start picking it apart and intentionally designing these aspects, but we can only do that once we actually see it for what it is. So takeaways for this lecture, we've talked a lot about what games are and how we can break them apart. We've talked about how 
a game is a problem solving activity that we approach with a playful attitude. It's entered willfully, we're learning new skills, we're applying those skills, and we're showcasing how awesome they are. We're breaking apart, we can break it apart as the tetrad. Uh, we are seeing it as mechanics, story, aesthetics, and technology. That's really what a game is, what a game must be. And by looking at it in that way, we can find harmony. We can make sure that the rules of the game make sense with the story of the game, that the mechanics of the game actually work with the technology that we're working with, that the visual aesthetic works with the technology that we're working with, that the story feels mechanically similar, or feels similar to what the player is doing mechanically. So it lets us see harmony and examine the overall pitch of our game. But we can also break it down into the structural elements. In fact, we really have to break it down into the structural elements. We think about the resources, the actions the player can take, the rules of the game. We think about the obstacles, the things getting in the way of their goals, and of course, the goals of the game at that point. So we need to consider all these different elements because we are the ones as game designers who have to design them. They aren't innate and everything is in there intentionally. We didn't just put it in because that's what other games do. And then, the games can be seen as loops. And that's really, really vital because if a game is a problem of solving activity, then we need to be good at providing them with solvable problems. We need to be good at training them and teaching them to accomplish things. And we do that through feedback loops. We do that through having them update their mental model. So by seeing the games as loops, we really start to see it as a series of problem solving activities. And once we see it as a series of problem solving activities, we can start asking questions about those activities. We can start making sure that each of those individual activities are fun and that the core activity that they're doing throughout the entire game is engaging. Okay, so our first side quest is posted. So I would like everybody um, to consider this at least. It's a good way to test out uh, getting your first side quest up um, and go through the whole process. We're going to be doing uh, the structure of a game and you can complete this anytime, but I do suggest taking a look at it this week because I think it'll help you uh, going forward. So this is the structure of a game quest. Uh, this is to be done solo and it's worth 2% and I'm only going to allow one of these. Uh, so you can complete it once and then you'll have to do some other side quests. I want you to mindfully play a game and pay close attention to the structural and harmonious aspects of it. It could be a video game, it could be a tabletop game, whatever. Just play a game for a little bit. It could be 10 minutes, it could be half an hour, it could be eight hours if you're so inclined. Um, and just pay attention to the things that we talked about today. I want you to write under one page. It shouldn't be long, just whatever you need to say. Um, and clearly write out what you think the elemental tetrad looks like. Just, it could be one sentence for everything. We did some of that earlier and talk about the structural elements. Specifically, look at the kind of four major elements, the resources, the actions, the obstacles, and the goals. There's plenty more, you could go into them if they're interesting, but those are the major ones that I want you to be able to see and pull apart. And then in one paragraph, uh, can't really do less, describe how the different tetradic elements actually work together, or maybe they don't work together, and think about how they build up one another or uh, kind of make one another work worse. I want you to consider that. So there should be uh, now or shortly a side quest assignment on Brightspace, and there should be some instructions on how to actually submit to that. Basically, what I'm going to be trying is using that assignment to submit all of your side quests to, and just try to follow the conventions that it talks about so that we can uh, keep them straight while grading. So you submit it to that, and then we'll update the grade over time uh, as we see new submissions coming in. So full instructions will be on Brightspace. Take a look at that. Um, and yeah, I highly recommend checking this one out immediately. If you've got some time on the weekend, this shouldn't take you very long. Just play the game, jot point out some stuff, and that should be good enough. Um, also worth mentioning, so these side quests are going to be graded just satisfactory or unsatisfactory. And we're going to be quite lenient with what's considered satisfactory or not. And worth saying as well, if you have any side quests that you think are relevant to the course goals, then feel free to let me know and I may make them uh, official side quests or just give a special exception if you have something in mind. So 
Let me know if you have any ideas for side quests. I'll be posting a bunch as we go throughout the course. But for now, this is the one that I want people to focus on because I think it's the most valuable. So next week, we are going to be talking about why we actually play games, what makes gameplay meaningful, and we're going to start assignment one at next week's tutorial. Make sure you show up, check your schedule times, and I will see everybody next week. Take care.